This is Twit. So we have another test flight coming up in a matter of days, we hope. Test That's flight right. seven. We've got some new goals here. We're not just going to fly a banana this time like they did <laughs> in the last one. They're going to actually fly payload, um, which I'm going to let you guys uh, kick around. But let me just kind of kind of do a quick rundown here. So, um, uh, let's see, we've got uh, a Raptor version three being tested, I think. 30, ve- 30 cameras on the vehicle this time. Ship, the upper stage, will have catch pins. Not not so that they can catch it this time, but so that they can see how they do aerodynamically in flight and make sure they don't burn off when they're coming home. They're going to deploy 10 Starlink simulators out of their little te- Pez dispenser thing up in the cargo bay. Uh, they're going to refly. This is the first reflight of a used engine, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, on the booster, engine 314. And uh, a faster, this is this sounds scary, but this is typical Elon speak, faster and harder catch a booster with a steeper and harder re-entry. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, we, we forgot the part where they're, they're carrying 25% more fuel on this, uh, on this vehicle. Uh, so they've increased on the booster the or the upper on stage. The, uh, they said uh, redesigns include uh, to the propulsion system include, a 25%. So it's unclear if it's on the booster or if it's on hmm. the ship itself. But they did also uh, improve the uh, quote unquote vacuum jacketing of the feed lines as well as a new feed line system for the Raptor vacuum engines. Um, uh, there's a new uh, there's a new ship computer, a flight computer, uh, basically a bunch of things to increase its ability to stay in space for longer uh, periods of time, which you would need for, for that. I mean, this seems like a lot of stuff that that is like a, a a new iteration. I mean, they're not calling this Starship V two like they did for Dragon, because it seems like they've got in in in, 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 in place. Would you want to call something that looks like this V two? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, right? I guess so. <laughs> Version but, uh, two, Mark but, two. Uh, yeah, but but the, the, there's, there's there's a few other advancements that I'm really interested in. That's the fact that they moved the location of the forward flaps on the ship vehicle, uh, and they reduced their size so that they shouldn't see the amount of burn through that they saw mm. at the at the flap hinges, uh, which was really dramatic footage from previous ones. Uh, they've also uh, increased, I believe, the um, the communications Starlink networks uh, of it with all these extra cameras so that they, they can have more than 120 megabits uh, per second uh, of, of real-time HD, which is pretty crazy uh, for this kind of a vehicle. It's super, super visibly instrumented, and it, it not only gives them very clear ideas of what's going on with the with the spacecraft uh, as it's flying through space or the booster on its way back down, but it gives us all just some spectacular views uh, of it. I mean, it's, it's mesmerizing to watch and everyone should be looking for that in flight seven to see how it all uh, shakes out because just seeing that glow on re-entry is pretty spectacular. So, I mean, overall, this seems exciting. Well, It'd be, the glow and the little melty bits that are flying away from well, it. Well, that shouldn't happen with these new things because they've got it, right, right, Leonard, they have a new, a, yeah, they're, they're testing new heat shields GPS on this stuff. one. Yeah, so that's good. And, you know, learn as you fly, fly as you learn. I mean, it. he's really, you know, uh, slogan that, and uh, he's proven that. And uh, I think the only thing that hangs out there, I'm fascinated by this Pez dispenser with the Starlink. I, if I read it right, I thought they auger into the Indian Ocean. It's not kind of they're yeah. not going to go into orbit, right? No, they're not. So, so the when when we say Pez dispenser, it is what it sounds like. It's a slot yeah. on the hull of the spacecraft. In fact, they loaded them into that slot. And they think that uh, they, they, they're designed to kind of spit out these flat Starlink satellites in a line, and then they're going to trail the ship uh, on, on its way back down to the Indian Ocean. Uh, and so they will burn up uh, over right. uh, if things go south. Because they're just a, mass simulators. They're, there not, a, they're not active there, satellites. There is a NOTAMS uh, for parts of like offshore New York <laughs> for, yeah, well, for, uh, for, for that's the actually no that's the blue origin. NOTAMS is uh, notice to airmen to stay out. But no, I got that wrong. That was the NOTAM for the Blue Origin flight uh, oh, for their, okay. mass, their their Blue Ring simulator. So I'm getting all my private space flights mixed up right now. There's so many. Boy, we're so having a, guy a in his private- great time uh, for sure. Uh, you know, the only thing that uh, I I think is worth noting here is again I'm getting back to this how 
how much fun we're having yeah. <laughs> uh, watching this guy do this stuff. I mean, uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, even in the Saturn program, I, I don't remember that many changes happening that fast. And uh, No. Well, know, do, do you remember I mean, back there in were 2010? Fixes, but there were fixes to the Saturn V, but there weren't major design changes. It was yeah, like, uh, okay, we got to change the flex joint on engine uh, on the uh, first stage engines so they don't rattle through. But it wasn't like, hey, let's change the entire configuration of the upper fuselage. Yeah. Uh, I did want to point out that uh, also, I don't think it's on this flight. But they're they're uh, ramping up to test active cooling as well, which is something no, that it's on this flight. Yeah, it is yeah. on this so, flight. OK, so, what so they, what that's they've, what, what they've done is they've they've enhanced the, the TPS system that Leonard was talking about. And then as a backup, they put an active cooling system on some tiles to yeah. see how that works, too, as like a backup to see how it performs. So the explanation of that uh, was first uh, the first time I saw it talked about anyway was on the dinosaur program back in the late 50s early 60s which was an air force uh mini space shuttle that they were working on that never flew they they did a, a mock-up and a lot of studies and built bits and pieces and tested them but never actually flew the thing which is a shame because it would have put us into winged space flight in a decade earlier well almost two decades earlier than we actually did um but it's basically using fluids either as a a behind the back plane or as an active spray in front of the tiles to create this this effectively a cooling field right mm -hmm. yeah yeah one so. thing about that that i'm i'm not clear on but it i i'm going back to gemini you know the idea that you can use starlink to monitor the entire re-entry all the way down to the this terrain surface right there was a moment there with Merving, you know, where they the plasma buildup around spacecraft, you always have the dead zone. The astronauts couldn't talk through. No, nobody knew if they were okay, do they survive right. the entry. And all of a sudden we're seeing all the way down from, you know, the plasma buildup, watching the whole thing happen. And I don't know what what happened there, but, you know, that was a big deal for the military back in the early d days, because they were worried about, uh, you know, if you're launching a warhead, are we going to lose contact with the warhead if we, oh, maybe we shouldn't fire that, or we, we try to orient it some other way. Um, so I'm very curious about how uh, this this capability has evolved of watching a, uh, a plasma-surrounded vehicle come in all the way down to the surface, and we see the whole thing. Uh, that's fascinating to me. I don't know what happened or you know what new capabilities are involved. Yeah, and I guess to to some limited degree, uh, perfecting your system of monitoring all aspects of flight from Earth orbit, yeah, would give you some forward information for setting up uh, relay satellites around the Moon and Mars that you're going to eventually need because. Mars, yeah. you know, if they're going to do what they want to do at Mars, they're going to certainly need telecommunications or broadband system. And we don't want to lay cables on Mars like we did across the Atlantic. You can just set up satellites. And then, of course, the Chinese have got the Magpie satellites orbiting the moon already, which, in my opinion, we should have done back in the 60s like we planned, but we didn't here in the U.S. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, or see the link in the description below. See you there.